So hello everyone and welcome to this video where I'm gonna talk about WebRTC and the meeting platform I made using this technology. For those who don't know what WebRTC is, it's pretty simple. It's a library who's allowing you to send audio and video track in peer-to-peer. -peer. Basically what it means is that with this technology you are able to talk and even be seen by the people you are connected to. So the obvious thing to make with this technology was a meeting platform. And it's actually what I did. I used WebRTC to recreate a Google Meet, the famous meeting platform. Hugo Meet is actually available now. If you pause the video or you wait the end, you can go on hugomeet.com and just make meeting with your friend and your family. But before going into Hugo Meet and everything, I just want to mention that I don't want to replace Google Meet or whatever. But the reason why it is available uh, online is just because at the end I was very proud of what I've done and it was really stable, like production ready. So I felt like it was a good idea to uh, publish it. And for you, it will be much more interesting to have something to hold on and go on the website, test the old features and everything. So that's why uh, it's actually available. WebRTC is a great technology and it's used by plenty of platforms that you currently use like Discord, WhatsApp, Google Meet obviously and even video games like Fortnite who are using WebRTC for their voice chat who's allowing players to speak to their teammate. And the reason why I use WebRTC rather than another technology is because uh, I needed it for another project. But also WebRTC is perfect for meeting for two points. The first one is because it's peer-to-peer -peer, so it means that you directly connected to the other client, the one who's receiving your video on audio, like your friend. And the second one is UDP. UDP is a protocol to send package. Basically, there are two of them. There's TCP and UDP. And TCP is doing a lot of processing to make sure that the second peer receives the package you are sending. And UDP don't care about that. He's just gonna send all the package you are giving him. And when we are doing a meeting, that's exactly what we need. We need to be synchronized at all time and don't really care if the package is arrived or not because we don't mind having a little cut in our conversation. It will be much more annoying if you started to hear what your friend said a couple minutes ago and you're desynchronized. That's why I choose WebRTC, but there is other advantage to use WebRTC like the compatibility. WebRTC is powered by Google and they are making a lot of effort to make it available on every single browser like Firefox and everything. There's multiple debug tools already available on those platforms. And so if you're using WebRTC, you're pretty much sure that everyone on every browser will be able to get all the data, video and audio. Okay, now let's talk about Hugo Meet. I won't go in every detail because I don't think it's very interesting since you already know what Google Meet do and I almost do the same. There's still some interesting stuff to say. Uh, the first one is that I don't have all the features that have Google Meet uh, for plenty of reason, like sometimes it's difficult features, sometimes it's because I don't have enough time, I just want to do another project. So in those features, there is the planning feature who's allowing you to create a meeting in your calendar and everything. There is also the sharing screen feature and also the room chat. If you go in Hugo Meet, you're gonna see three pages. Uh, the first one is the landing page. This page is here for creating room and even joining them. But it's mostly for creating your room because if you want to join a room, you just have to click on the link that your friend gave you. Once you used one of those buttons, you're gonna go into the pre room page. This page is very useful because you can see yourself and turn on or off the camera and the microphone before going into the meeting. And in this page, you also have to specify the name that you choose to be identified in the room. I said it like that because you can put everything you want. If you want to be called the exclamation point, you can. I don't check anything. But I encourage you using your name or just a username because uh, this field is stored into a cookie who's gonna autofill this field the next time you're gonna go into the pre room. And once you've done that, you can click on the join button who's gonna connect you with the server. And if there is another person in the room, you're gonna ask him if he wants you to let you in. And if he does, you're gonna go into the next page. The next page is the room page. And this is the page where you're gonna be when you are doing a meeting and you are talking to uh, other people. You also can turn on or off uh, the microphone and the camera. And you also have a button to hang out. But if you are looking into my source code, you'll notice that there is only two pages, uh, the landing page and the room page. 
And that's because the prayer room and the room that I talked before was actually not pages, but there is what I called layers. And what I do is firstly showing you the prayer room layer. And once you're clicking on join and you've been allowed into the meeting, I'm going to show you the second layer, the room layer. Okay, I've done that because I needed to be sure that before going to a meeting, you're going to go through the prayer room. And also it makes the sharing meeting more accessible and easy because you only have to uh, copy your URL and just pass it to uh, your friend or the person you want to invite. And once I click in the link, that will be rejected in Meet. And the first thing they'll see is not the room, even if they are in the same page, they're going to see the prayer room layer. On the server side, I try to keep it very simple. And there's three parts I want to talk about. The first part is uh, storing data because I didn't use a database Lohan API because it was overkill for the use I needed. And instead I store every data in local. But that means I can't keep any data. Once my server ends, like if I stopped it or if it crashed, all the data I delete and I can't recover them. But that wasn't much a problem because I don't keep a lot of data. The only thing I store is your name and which room did you join. The second port is the signaling server. This port is mostly for WebRTC and his purpose is to redirect messages. Like if you are in a room and you want to send a message to uh, your friend, you have to uh, send a message to my signaling server and telling that you want your friend to be the receiver of this message and my server will gonna send the message to uh, your friend. On the third part, it's the stun server. This is also for WebRTC. This server is actually not mine. It's a server powered by Google. It's public for everyone who wants to use it because it's very cheap to maintain. And since Google is pushing WebRTC, it's feel normal to have free tools. So now let's talk about WebRTC. I, I try to keep it simple, but if you've never done programmation before, it may be pretty difficult, but I try to keep it clear. So in WebRTC, what we're trying to achieve is having two peers, like two computers uh, connected together in what we call peer-to-peer -peer connection. This connection will allow us to send audio and video track through it. But the major problem is that your computer, your device, like your phone, etc., are not directly connected to internet. They are connected to your router and this router is connected to internet. Everything was connected to your router. We say that they're in a local environment. And the thing special about the local environment is that it's very secure because your router is protecting you from external connection to not let anybody connected to you and install your data. And that means peer-to-peer -peer connection are difficult to make because you're trying to connect two devices who is in different local environments. But there's still a way to achieve that and this is by trusting your connection. What it means is that your router has some rules to accept or not a connection and you have to make your peer-to-peer -peer connection match those rules. And this is done by something that's called negotiation. Basically, it's an exchange of information on both sides through the signaling server to establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Before going into the negotiation, I'm just going to tell you which information we're trying to get from those negotiations. You need four information. The first one is your public IP. And the second one is your ICE candidate. And you also need those two information about the peer you're trying to connect it to. The first and the third are the public IP. Those are really necessary to be able to know who you are being connected to. And the second and the fourth are the ICE candidate. The ICE candidate are an object who is created by WebRTC and is described a method of communication. For you as a human, a method of communication could be your phone number or your email address, anything that could be used to communicate with you. The second peer also need those four information, the same as you, as they need to be synchronized at all time. If they don't, the peer-to-peer -peer connection is broken and you, you can't send audio and video anymore. So now let's talk about the negotiation step by step. So let's mean there's a peer one who wants to be connected to a peer two. The first thing the peer one needs to do is creating an offer through WebRTC. When WebRTC receives this message, it's going to ask the stun server about the public IP of the peer one. And once he gets this information, he's going to send the offer to the peer one. Once the peer one receives the offer he has for, he's going to keep a copy of this information for itself as a local description. And he's going to send another to the peer two through the signaling server. At the meantime, once the peer one creates an offer, 
WebRTC is smart enough to automatically generate ice candidate and give them to the peer one. The peer one don't have to uh, get a copy of this ice candidate for itself because WebRTC automatically update the local description with those ice candidate. But it still need to send them to the peer two for him to update the offer the peer one already sent. On the side of the peer 2, he'll firstly get the offer the peer 1 send, and with this, he'll know two things. The first thing is that someone is trying to be connected with him, and the second thing is the IP of this person. So once he get the offer of the peer 1, he's gonna keep it as a remote description, and just after that, the peer 2 gonna ask WebRTC for creating an answer. This answer is totally like an offer, it's just on the side of the peer you are trying to be connected with. So exactly like an offer, WebRTC gonna ask the stand server for the public IP of the peer 2, and once he get the information, he's gonna send it to the peer 2. The peer 2 will keep a copy for himself, as a local description and send another copy to the peer one. And right after, WebRTC will also automatically generate ICE candidate for the peer two. And the peer two will send those ICE candidate to the peer one. And at this point, the peer two had all the information because in the meantime, he received the ICE candidate of the peer one. And a couple of milliseconds later, the peer one will follow once all the messages from the peer two have arrived. This was the negotiation. And the negotiation happened only once at the start. But in fact, there is another moment where the negotiation has to happen once again. And this is when one of the two peers are making a big change on the connection. The most of the time is because someone had a new track audio or video, like uh, if you are changing your camera or something. And when this happens, the two peers have to send the offer and the answer once again. And this is called renegotiation. We have to do that because an offer and an answer is also called local and remote description. Those descriptions contain all the information of the peer-to-peer -peer connection. And since they have to be synchronized at all time, once you're adding like an audio track to this description, you have to send this one to the second peer to him to be updated. The local description is the object that you create through WebRTC. Either it's an offer or an answer. And the remote description is the offer or the answer that you receive through the signaling server. The remote description contains all the information of the peer you are connected to, and the local description contains all the information about yourself. So now I think it's time for me to uh, let go the web OTC. I give you a lot of information, it was pretty dense. But before ending the video, I just want to make a little conclusion about Hugo Meet and all the mistakes I made. Because there are a lot of them, but I'm just gonna go through uh, the major one. Those are not just mistakes, it's also because I have decided to make an end of Hugo Meet. But with more time, I could fix all of those issues. So the first issue about Hugo Meet is the security. There are actually none. I mean, the WebRTC and the WebSocket connection are not encrypted. So there is a possibility of someone trying to connect to those connections and able to get all the data and since it's audio and video track, they may be able to listen to you or even see you. Yeah, don't be scared about that because there's not many people who know Hugo Meet and I think it's take a lot of skill to do that. But still, don't try to make important call on Hugo Meet. Go on other platform like Google Meet. It will be much, much, much more secure. The second issue I wanted to talk about, because I think it's pretty funny, is that Hugo Meet is based on the assumption that it won't be used much. When you're on the landing page and you wanted to create a new room, you're gonna click on the button create a new room. And this button are gonna generate a random ID for your room. But since it's random, that means that I never checked if this room is already in use. That means that if you were like a million of users on Hugo Meet, it may be pretty great possibility of you clicking on a new room and going into the room where is already someone. Luckily, you can't join them because you're gonna ask the owner to join the room and he can just deny you. But still, it's pretty bad. It's directly come from the fact that I don't have a database. The third issue is very important. And this issue is that there is no turn server on Hugo Meet. A turn server is something for WebRTC. Like I explained later, it's very difficult to be connected to a local environment. But it's even more difficult when the people you are trying to be connected to had router with a symmetric NAT. Basically what it means is like a super router who's got like very very restricted rules. You can't do a peer-to-peer -peer connection anymore. And to still be able to connect those people, you need to redirect the peer-to-peer -peer connection with a turn server. That make it a lot slower, but that's the only way to be connected with those people. 
The fourth issue I want to mention is that the renegotiations are not polite. What I mean by that is, I'm pretty sure it already happened to you when you're trying to speak to someone and he's speaking on the same time of you, and right after you stop talking, but the people doing at the same time, and so you're like, there is like a confusion between uh, both of you. And to end this, you need someone to, to say, yeah, you first or something. The fact is, this kind of behavior can also happen to computers. And you need to create a behavior whose one of the two peers are saying, okay, you first. In Hugomid, it can happen when both peers trying to put on the camera at the same time. Exactly at the same time, I mean. Because when you're trying to uh, turn on the camera, it's gonna engage a renegotiation. And when those renegotiations gonna happen to someone who's already trying to renegotiate, uh, it will make a conflict. So the thing I will need to do is uh, handle this conflict to, let's say, yeah, you can renegotiate with me. I need one of those pins to be polite. As you can see, they still need a more development on Hugo Meet, but I'm still I'm still proud of it. It worked fine and I mean, I make a few calls with it. It was pretty fun. But yeah, after all of that, it's definitely not gonna replace Google Meet. It's just not good enough. But I encourage you to also download the source code if you are interested to learn more or if you just want to make a copy for impress your friend or whatever. Do whatever you want with the source code. I give it to you. Hope it will save on some way and, and that's it. Have a good day, guys, and see you next time for a new side project or something. Bye.